It's easy to get distracted in the book of Acts uh, on this or that issue, but one thing that's consistent through the book is to focus on God. So in our concern about missions or our concern about the filling of the Holy Spirit or our concern about the church or church growth or whatever we might be looking for in Acts, you know, we don't want to read it against itself. It's talking to us, most of all, about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we don't want to forget that emphasis. So that's kind of page one. Then page two, actually at the bottom of page one, it says postscripts, postscript. And what I do there is summarize uh, what you might call ten, ten pillars, ten uh, points at which, quite apart from biblical scholarship, if you're a classical historian and you read the book of Acts and you know your ancient Greco-Roman sources, you can uh, locate Acts on the on the map of, of ancient world history. I know when I was a kid being taken to church, I really had no idea how real the Bible was. I mean, it's real enough to talk about in church, but I think, you know, as I may have said last time, the pastor who said something stern to his son and, and uh, the son said, Daddy, are you telling the truth or are you just preaching? You know, there, there's this idea that, uh, you know, preachers preach from this big black book, or maybe now they're from their iPhone, and who knows the, the, the status of the Bible compared to science and medicine and mathematics and, and real hard uh, subjects, hard, uh, hard data. Well, in, in these points here, 1 through 10, which I, I, I won't read, um, you can see that F.F. Uh, F. Bruce, that's down in footnote one, F.F. F. Bruce wrote an article years ago, Chronological Questions in the Acts of the Apostles. He trained as a, uh, a Roman historian. That was his first area of expertise. And then he was called to a chair of biblical exegesis mid-career, and he took up that chair and became one of the leading New Testament scholars in the world back in the 50s, 60s, uh, 70s. He also was uh, a world-recognized scholar on the Old Testament. I think still the only scholar ever to head up the, the, world, the, the, the world's leading uh, society, both of Old Testament scholarship and of New Testament scholarship. And that was F.F. F. Bruce. So, for example, if you look at number five, the expulsion of Jews from Rome under Claudius, uh, we know from other sources that this took place, and it took place around the time that Acts locates it. Or in number six, uh, Gallio's proconsulship in Achaia, the capital, uh, the capital city was Corinth, and Achaia was the, the uh, district in which Corinth was located. Uh, inscriptions have been found that document his, his uh, inauguration in um, AD 50, spring of AD 50. Came to power about May 51. So um, those points are there just to underscore that uh, there's a historical bedrock to the book of Acts. And I think I've said enough about Luke as the author of Luke and Acts just to, to confirm that this is one of Luke's hallmarks is that he locates the things he writes about relative to facts in Roman history, like in the reign of Caesar Augustus. You know, he's very careful to tell us who the, the main uh, rulers are uh, at the time that the word of the Lord came to John the Baptist or whatever happened. Then there is a, uh, actually a foreshadowing of this class next semester or next, uh, whatever you want to call next year, I guess, because uh, they, they want this class to continue and start from Romans, go to the end of Revelation. And if it does, we'll start in January, and we'll start with Romans, I'm going to guess, at least with Paul. And here's a chronology that uh, in the left-hand column sets out dates, A.D. dates. And then in the middle column has events, and especially on, on page three, the handout, it's got the, uh, Paul's letters, 
highlighted with Galatians coming first. And then on the right-hand column, there are references. They're all references to Acts, unless otherwise noted. And they help us to see where Paul's letters were written relative to the narrative of Acts. So there again, um, you can sit in church all your life and, and never give a thought to, you know, when was Colossians written? When was Galatians written? How does that fit in with the book of Acts? I mean, I think most casual church goers, they, they never think about that. But actually, you know, when you do the, uh, do your homework, you, you can see pretty much where, where Galatians uh, can plausibly be slotted in, and it's right after the first missionary journey, Acts 13 and 14, and Paul and Barnabas evangelize an area that the Romans called Galatia. And then as he writes in the opening verses of Galatia, I'm amazed that you're so quickly falling away from the one who called you. He planted these churches, and then people came in and behind him and tried to undermine what, what he had established or what the Lord had established. So Galatians is written to uh, push back against the false teachers and to try to stabilize the new believers. So that, in a way, is the first lecture, which I'm not, I'm not really going to give. I, I'm, just, I'm just reviewing. But I wanted to give an account of what this is in your notes. It's, in its way, it's very valuable material. And you know, if you're a real history buff, you could go to a good library, and a librarian would be happy to to help you track down the, uh, the article that's uh, on page 2, footnote 1, by Bruce, and it's in the Bulletin of the John Rylands Library. And, uh, uh, you know, your, your uh, municipal library could order that for you, and you, they might send you, I don't know if they'd send you a hard copy or a PDF, but you could actually read the full article. And if you're a history buff, then uh, you know you, you could check out the argumentation evidence for yourself. Any questions about that non-lecture? <laughs> uh, I know we're finishing up John tonight, and, and really everything I've got pretty much centers on John, and we're still just scratching the surface. But before we start scratching the surface of John, I wouldn't mind taking uh, the rest of, of our time here um, for this segment and maybe the beginning of the next one to just look at your readings for tonight. And I think you read the, uh, the chapter on John, for one thing, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you did the, uh, the Yarbrough Elwell readings, then on page 102, there's a summary of that chapter. And in the summary... I'll just underscore that John is distinct from Matthew, Mark, Luke. I don't think that means John's wrong and they're right, or vice versa. And scholars debate how much John knew about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And was he writing, trying to augment what they didn't say? Was he giving a thought to what they had written? Was he re reacting against what they had written? N nobody really says. I, th I think it works best just to see them as uh, four complementary accounts of the life of Jesus, three of them which resemble each other more and one of them uh, which takes a different tack in the, the stresses that it makes. You can see the author was John the son of Zebedee. Did you notice as you're reading John's gospel, uh, he never appears in it. You know, he's not named. He's one of the three. Peter, James, and John, but John, the son of Zebedee, is never named. Now, I think he's the beloved disciple, but technically, you know, he doesn't occur in the book by name. Number three, um, Jesus, or you could say that's about the incarnation and how John stresses Jesus' divine qualities. Um, Jesus' status as God's unique divine representative, and then Jesus fulfilling Israel's and humanity's hopes. Four, Jesus' human nature. Five, faith. Six, 
the people who believed in Jesus. Of course, there were a lot of people who didn't believe in Jesus too. And then seven more or less sums up the Gospel of John as pertaining to the doctrine of Christ. Jesus is a divine and human Savior sent by God for us to believe in and follow. So did anybody have an outstanding question about chapter 7? Or something got stuck in your craw as you read it? You, you might note on page 100 that there's a sidebar called Focus 7. And I mentioned two books in that sidebar, um, especially the one by Michael Lacona. Now, it's 700 pages long, <laughs> but it's just to say that, you know, within the last 15 years, two of the longest books ever to have been written on Jesus' resurrection, you know, have appeared. And one of them is by N.T. Wright, and the other is by Michael Lacona. N.T. Wright is a bit my senior, Lacona is a bit my junior, uh, but they are both... They have different approaches, but they're both very methodical and thorough defenses of Jesus' bodily resurrection after death. Um, and those books are often at a premium. You know, it's usually more the skeptics who write long books about Jesus, and they end up, you know, doubting his resurrection or arguing against it. But these are books that, they, you know, they all just kind of got, got fed up with all the skepticism, and so they, they wrote defenses. So if you're looking for scholarly defenses of Jesus' resurrection, then uh, those are two encouraging places to go. Now, another chapter you read for today was chapter, which was it? Chapter 9. And so there's a summary there down around page 130. Six, and this chapter has to do with Jesus' teachings. Jesus came primarily as a preacher teacher. Uh, he communicated his message in a form similar to that of rabbis, not identical, but similar. He taught a lot about the kingdom of God. Uh, he had a unique, what we call filial. Consciousness, F-I-L-I-A-L, -I -I a unique filial consciousness. Like we have the word affiliation. Uh, so it has to do with family, you know, relationship. And a, a verse that I'll touch on in other connections is uh, 518. It says, for this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. It says in 517, they picked up stones to stone him. They were seeking to kill him because he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. You know, it's, it's not a problem if you say our father. Jesus taught us to, to pray our father. He didn't preach it, tell us, teach us to pray my father. And if by that you mean our father, okay. But technically, Jesus' sonship is a cut above our sonship because he is the incarnation of God. We're not the incarnation of God. We're created beings. He assumed flesh. He came in the likeness of flesh, but he had a relationship to God that was, uh, that was both very much like ours and also not like ours. So that's a, that's a big deal. Um, his, his, his consciousness of a unique relationship with God. Five, ultimate destiny. You know, this really applies not only to John, but, but all the Gospels. Um, I've got a, a long, long time friend, a, I mean a colleague. Uh, we taught together back in the late 80s. He's now at St. Louis University. His name's, his name's Mike McClymond. And he's published a lot. Uh, he told me several years ago he's working on a book on universalism. You know, the doctrine that everybody's going to go to heaven. And uh, 
I ran into him the other day and he said, you know, I'm still working on that book. In fact, it's in page proofs. But I knew it was going to be a big book, but actually it's not going to be two volumes. And he keeps having to expand it because more and more writers, including evangelical writers, are coming out in favor of the view that, you know, nobody's going to suffer eternal punishment. Nobody's going to die and face judgment. Uh, God's just going to say, oh, well, you know, everybody's okay. Come on into heaven. <laughs> And when you read the Gospels, you get this impression that it's very, very important that people repent and follow Jesus. Because Jesus, as you often hear in sermons, I hope, uh, he taught more about hell than he did about heaven. Heaven's pretty murky in Jesus' teaching. It's definite. But, you know, he doesn't go into a lot of detail. But you get quite a bit of detail about hell. At least you hear more about it by volume. So that's one of the things he taught was the importance of taking our ultimate destiny seriously. Uh, six talks about Jesus' special mission and his awareness of it. And there's another word I can, I can throw out here or, or term that, you know, in an introductory class, we don't have time to, to develop, but, but just, you know, for your own, it's, I think it's a valuable concept. I may have mentioned it in earlier weeks. Uh, Jesus' messianic self-consciousness. His messianic self-consciousness. Uh, number six says he, he realized his special mission early. But that's another thing that, you know, in the, in the course of church life, we, you know, we just, he's the son of God. <laughs> and he came as a baby. But, you know, when you think about, okay, well, how did that work? <laughs> you know, when he was in the cradle, what was he thinking about? You know, what, what was the status of his awareness? And uh, some of these questions are mysterious, and like I say, we don't have time to go into them in detail, but that's one of the wonders of the incarnation that Jesus fully shared. Um, he fully shared in our humanity. He didn't cheat. You know, uh, he had to, the Bible says he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. So, so he grew in what he knew and, and, in, and in size. He went through the same life we live, but the difference is he became aware of his status as God's son, the chosen one of Israel, and the Savior, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So that, that's a big deal in, uh, in Jesus' studies. He used a lot of titles, or they were used of him. His chief objective was to make God real in the lives of people by stressing the love and concern of God instead of legal requirements. And that, you know, you could haggle about that, but that's a fair statement. A lot of people then as now thought, you know, through this or that religious means, you could kind of get God off your case. And Jesus came modeling uh, what's called the knowledge of a God who calls people into a saving relationship with him. And he transforms them from the inside in such a way that they don't just do what the, do what the man upstairs says, <laughs> but they can pray our Father, and they can be forgiven of their sins, and they can walk with him as his disciples, and his servants, and his worshipers, and so forth. So another way you could put that is, is Jesus was trying to call people into a personal relationship with God through their trust in him. So I want to stress that because a lot of people get into the teachings of Jesus and they reduce Jesus to his teachings. And it's very important that we understand we can't follow Jesus' teachings sufficiently to be saved. And anyway, there are just a lot of things, there are a lot of gaps. You know, when we look at practical life, Jesus didn't teach about everything. So if, if, if we primarily look to Jesus as the saving teacher, there's, there's, there's a lot lacking there. But if we look at Jesus' teachings as meant to inform those who come into a saving relationship with God, and we see his teachings in conjunction with other, other apostolic teachings and Old Testament teachings, well, then his teachings, you know, they're, they're you know, sort of the, the apex of a whole body of lore that the Bible furnishes us to, uh, to work out our relationship with God through faith in Christ. 
a true disciple follows Jesus, and there is a world to come, number 10. Life does not end at death. And uh, that's, that's a, uh, obviously, you could say the most glorious dimension of Jesus' teaching. I go to prepare a place for you. I am the resurrection and the life. And all kinds of passages where uh, he promises to be with his disciples into the end of the age and beyond. So let us take a break at this point. Thank you.